Hello students and welcome to our unit on parasitic helminths uh, for Microbiology 205. And we've just finished the section on protists, which are large, complicated, complex, uh, single-celled eukaryotes that are of in medical importance. We discussed some of the ones that were of medical importance and we discussed a few of them that were just of ecological importance. We're going to do exactly the same thing with the parasitic helminths. Helminths is a term that is used by parasitologists, exclusively to parasitologists, to refer to several different phyla of microscopic worms uh, some of which can, or many of which, can be dangerous to humans uh, that can make humans ill. However, if you were a, an ecologist or any other kind of a biologist, you would not group these different microscopic worms together. Uh, you would put them according to their phyla. So, for example, there's a phyla, there is a phylum nematoda, and the, the phylum nematoda, the members are commonly referred to as nematodes. And there is another phylum called phylum platyhelminth. Platyhelminth, the word platy means flat, you know, like a platypus has a flat bill on it on the front of its face. Right? So platy, uh, you know, in German plattenspiel means a, a flat player, like a record player that you play vinyl records on. And so the platyhelminths are commonly referred to as the flatworms. Right. Now, if you're, if you're a biologist, that's how you would, if you're a, an ecologist or a phylogenist, that's how you would classify them. But if you, if you are, a, if you are a, parasitolog a parasitologist, you would group them all together as helminths. Okay, so we're going to go through some of the important groups of helminths now. Once again, this material is in Chapter 5. We're going to, chap we're going to study Chapter 5 in five different parts, but one at a time, and as I said before, it, this is one of the rare cases where the, the chapter has a lot less information than the lecture material. So by all means, pay most of your attention to the lecture material. I would not even read chapter five unless you get a little bit confused about something. But, but uh, my, my feeling was that while this book that we're using, the textbook that we're using, the OpenStax Microbiology book, is a great book because it's free, uh, it's not great you know, most things that are free are not as good as things that you have to pay for, but I realized it's it's kind of a compromise that I found this free book that's fairly good in most areas, uh, but it doesn't go into as much detail as I would have liked it to go into when it comes to protist helmets, fungi, and algae and lichens. Uh, so we're going to go into more detail on protists, more detail on helmets, and more detail on fungi than the textbook actually goes into. So your first source of information about potential questions for the quiz and information that you need to know for the quizzes and the exams, all of that information you should get from the, uh, from the lectures first and the lecture slides. Okay, so as I said, we're going to study two main groups of worms, microscopic worms. One of them is uh, the phylum nematoda which are microscopic, round, non-segmented worms. Uh, now, when I say round, that's to contrast them to the platyhelminths, which are flat. They are microscopic. Uh, and I say non-segmented because the platyhelminth worms are usually, many of them are segmented, meaning that they're, you know, they have these little parts, multiple parts that make up the body. And there's another uh, there's another phylum that we classify as worms, and that's the final, uh, the phylum Annelida, right? So the final the phylum Annelida includes the earthworms and things like that, none of which really are harmful to humans, so we're not going to discuss any of those worms. And also those worms are quite large. You never have microscopic members of the phylum Annelida. So for this, for the parasitology part of this course, we're the only uh, we're going to group together the platyhelminths and the nematodes together and call them helminths. And these are the two groups of worms that the two phyla of worms that contain members that are sometimes dangerous to humans and sometimes are helpful to humans and some most of the time are just neutral. Okay, so 
The, the phylum Nematoda contains microscopic, round, non-segmented worms. And if you look over there on the end, most are dioecious. Dioecious means that there are two sexes, two different sexes. There is a male and a female. All right, most of them are dioecious. Some of them are, what do you guess the word for having only one sex? Most of them are, uh, others are, a few of them are monoecious. All right, so dioecious, the word dioecious, you need to know that word means that there are two sexes. The human race, for instance, is dioecious. Many species of trees are dioecious versus many species of trees are monoecious. Okay, so many of the nematodes, we have ones that are both male and female. Most are dioecious. They generally live in the soil. That's the reservoir for these organisms. They have a soil reservoir. Uh, humans usually contract them by eating food that's contaminated with soil, or uh, in some cases by stepping on soil with bare feet, or in some cases by being bitten by an insect, and then it's transferred from the insect, that, and the insect in that case operates as a biological vector. All right, now the flatworms, phylum platyhelminths. There are two classes to, that, we, that are important to us. One is the class, trematode, uh, class trematoda. All right, so the class trematoda are commonly referred to as trematodes, trematodes. And they are more commonly referred to as flukes, flukes. Okay, now some of you may know, notice that in the English language, particularly in, the, in North America, we, we use the word fluke to mean something else. Fluke means a lucky mistake. So if you're playing hockey like a lot of Canadians do and somebody hits the puck in some wild direction and it, it just happens to go into the opposing goal by chance and all the other players say, oh, that was a fluke. You, did, you, didn't, you didn't accomplish that goal by skill. That was a fluke. Okay, so that's, that's one common usage of the word fluke. But anyone who has a little bit of scientific training or a little bit of biology training will, will understand that the word fluke Fluke means a type of a type of microscopic worm that infects humans and is can be particularly dangerous. Okay, so the class Trematoda are commonly known as the Trematodes and also commonly referred to as flukes. The class Cestoda or Cestoda is referred to as commonly referred to as cestodes or tapeworms. Okay, now I'm saying cestodes and cestodes because they're there's some people say each one. If you're going to be correct, biologically speaking, the, the Latin word Latin does not have a soft C where you pronounce a C as an S. You always pronounce a C as a hard C, Kestoda. But because there are enough people who say Sestoda, I'd accept either pronunciation. Okay, so usually we catch the we catch the Sestodes by eating undercooked beef or pork or fish. You already know about one of them. Well, you know about you know about one of them, which is uh, Diphyllobothrium latum, is a is a cestode, right? And it, it it is contracted by eating undercooked fish. If that fish is infected with the with the cestode first, uh, they they form cysts, which are like little shells that contain eggs, which contain uh, an inert form of the worm. Okay, so these are the these are the two phyla, phylum nematoda, the nematodes, and phylum platyhelminths, the flatworms. And then within the within the phylum platyhelminths, we're going to divide it up into two different classes, the trematodes and the and the cestodes. All right, so basically we have three groups, the nematodes, the trematodes, and the cestodes that together comprise the helminths. Okay, sorry to spring all that on you, but all of the, the, the different ones we're going to learn about, starting with the nematodes, we're going to start by learning about Toxocaracanus. What does the word canine mean? It means dog, doesn't it? And Toxocaracati are two nematodes that are found in the soil which uh, normally af affect dogs or cats, respectively. They live in the soil, but they can be ingested from earth if you eat soil that's contaminated with dog feces, dog excrement, or cat excrement. You could get these nematodes, and uh, they can make you quite ill. And that is one of the main reasons why, if you have a children's playground, they do not allow dogs or cats on the children's playground. The reason for that is because dogs defecate on the soil. Their owner, technically in most cities, if a dog 
people are out walking their dogs. If the dog excretes, if the dog defecates on the soil, you, the owner is expected to pick it up and put it in a bag and take it home and dispose of it, dispose of it down the toilet or in the garbage. You're not supposed to leave it on the ground, specifically because dogs and cats can carry these two nematode worms. And if children get onto the ground, children have a habit of putting everything in their mouths when they're down on the ground crawling around and they might ingest some of these nematodes and then get sick as well. Okay, Ancelostoma duodenale is commonly known as a hookworm, which is again a, a, a nematode that can infect animals, including humans. Trichinella spiralis causes trichinosis. We already, uh, we already learned about that as being something that you can catch from eating undercooked meat that was hunted by, uh, by people that hunt wild animals for food. Dyrophilaria imitus is known as dog heartworm. It is one of a class of diseases that are called filariases. So it is uh, di Dyrophilaria imitus, dog heartworm, is a fil filariasis, and so are these other two nematode, so are the diseases caused by these other two nematodes. One is called Wuchereria bancrofti, which causes a disease called elephantiasis, and one is called Onchocercus vul vulvulus, which causes a disease called river blindness. These three cause filariases, and so there's a special classification of diseases that are called filariases based on the fact that they're caused by this family, uh, members of this particular family of nematodes. Okay, now on with the platyhelminths, trematodes versus cestodes. Okay, so Clonorchis uh, sinensis, it's been a while since I've pronounced these things, so you'll have to forgive me. Clonorchis sinensis is also known as a liver fluke. It's one of the flukes. It's a, it's a trematode, uh, and it, ha it can cause liver cancer. Schistosoma, Schistosoma mansoni is, a, is known as a blood fluke. It's a, it's an, it's a uh, trematode as well. And the disease that it causes is called schistosomiasis. Schistosomiasis caused by Schistosoma mansoni. Fasciolepsis busci infects the intestines and causes fasciolepsiasis. Okay, those are the flukes, the main flukes that we're going to learn about, the trematodes. And then down here at the bottom, we have three cestodes that we're going to learn about. Tinea saginata and Tinea solium are beef tapeworm and pork tapeworm, respectively. They cause a disease called tiniasis. Tiniasis, uh, at its best, causes you to have a tapeworm that grows to enormous sizes inside your intestine and it lays eggs that get into your feces. If your feces gets into the ground and it gets into the vegetables and another person eats the vegetables, or if another animal, another cow or another pig eats vegetables that came out of the soil and those vegetables weren't properly washed, they can get the same tapeworms. Now, if they're in humans, the, at best, you get a tapeworm in your intestine that grows to an enormous size. You get sick and then they take it out surgically. At worst, the tapeworm will kind of metastasize. Meta metastasis, metastasis means that it spreads out all over the body, the way cancer does sometimes, metastasis. And it, 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 these eggs get into all the tissues of your body, including the brain. So you, you sometimes have tapeworm, uh, you, you hear of these rare cases where somebody dies of encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain, and then when they do the autopsy, you know, they cut open the person after they're dead to see what caused them to die. That's called an autopsy. And th they find that they have these cysts, these tapeworm cysts in the brain. Right? So that's a terrible way to die. That's a terrible thing to happen to somebody. And it can all be avo avoided if we just only buy beef and pork from farms that have been inspected. In Canada, we have the Canada Health Agency that, that inspects the farms and if, if there's a failure so that you find Tinea saginata or Tinea solium at a farm, then Canada, the Canadian government is to blame for that. But you know, if, if, the, if you buy meat from a, a farm that's not inspected because somebody's growing cattle or pigs secretly or something and you get tapeworm, then you have nobody but yourself to blame. And then, of course, the farmer will get charged, but you, but, uh, uh, you can't blame the government that way. So the 
so there's a there's a difference between you know it, it is nice to have government agencies like this even if they don't do a very good job sometimes because if they fail at their job at least you can blame the government as opposed to having nobody to blame all right now finally diphilobothrium latum is the largest of the tapeworms it can grow to up to 10 meters in length you can get it from undercooked fish which is as i said before is a tragedy for me because i love sushi uh, like a lot of people who were born and raised in Vancouver, I really love sushi, and there are a lot of sushi places around Vancouver. But you have to be careful where they get their fish from, because some of them claim to have fresh, they're preparing sushi from fresh fish that they buy off of the buy from the fishermen at Fisherman's Wharf, and that that's a really bad idea. Um, technically, the I, th I believe the health inspectors are supposed to inspect the sushi restaurants to make sure that they're flash freezing their fish to kill any. Diphilobothrium latum eggs or cysts that might be in the fish. All right, so this group, these are all nematodes. These are trematodes or flukes. And these are cestodes or tapeworms. All right, so let's just review a couple of these terms that you're very familiar with. Zoonosis means the disease that you contract from animals. A definitive host is where a parasite can undergo all the phases of its life cycle in the definitive host, whereas an intermediate host is a parasite that can only undergo some of its life cycle in the intermediate, in the intermediate host. Why this is important is we, in the last section, we talked about protozoa, where we actually have to worry about that. Right, so there are, for protozoa like, like Plasmodium vivax, for instance, there is a definitive host and then there are a number of intermediate hosts. In the previous section before that, we discussed different types of bacteria. Bacteria generally don't have uh, a definitive host versus an intermediate host because bacteria are a very simple life form. They, they divide, usually divide through binary fission uh, in fact, all the ones that I know of divide through binary fission. So it doesn't matter uh, whether there's no such thing really for bacteria in most cases, as far as I know, there's no such thing as a, as an, as a, a definitive host versus an intermediate host. But many protists exist in many different life forms throughout their life cycle. And there are definitive versus intermediate hosts. The same thing is true for some of the uh, some of the helmets, helmets, particularly, this is true particularly for the flukes, for the, for the trematodes. So the trematodes will have, many of the trematodes will have a definitive versus an intermediate host. Okay, we talked about a vector, which is usually an animal, an insect, or an arachnid that carries a microbe from one host to another. We talked about a reservoir. There are animal reservoirs versus inert or uh, in, inanimate reservoirs, like bodies of water or cans of food. Right? And there are zoonotic reservoirs, which are animal reservoirs. So, uh, for instance, cows are a reservoir for brucellosis. Monkeys are an animal or a zoonotic reservoir for malaria and so on. Okay, and then here's back to these words that we talked about just a minute ago. Monoecious means there's only one sex. Dioecious means there are two sexes, male and female, which is a more advanced trait. Uh, now, if you, ha if you are monoecious, there are two ways to do this. One is that you reproduce asexually, the way Giardia lamblia does, for instance. There's only one sex of Giardia lamblia. They divide, th they reproduce through binary fission. They simply split in half, and the two daughter cells are identical to the parent. Versus, there are monoecious animals and monoecious worms and monoecious protists, even, that are what are known as hermaphrodites. So a hermaphrodite hermaphrodite is an organism, an animal that has sex organs from both male and female in the same animal. Uh, so there are some, uh, there are some, uh, there are some helmets that are like that. There are some many trees that are like that. There are a lot of plants that are like that. Uh, a lot of most of the annelids, the, phy the phylum annelida, which we're not discussing here, but the phylum annelida, the earthworms and the other types of worms like that, they are usually uh, hermaphrodites. They have both male and female organs, which means that they can a worm, an earthworm, can mate with another earthworm which is a good thing because then you have then you create more genetic diversity if you have mating between two individuals sexual reproduction but a wor an earthworm can also reproduce all by itself simply by curling into a you know into a half circle so that the male and the female sex organs of the earthworm come together 
And so uh, that's not as good. I mean, it perpetuates the species by making more earthworms, which is a good thing, but it doesn't create genetic diversity, which is a source of strength and which is a source of rapid evolution. That's the idea. All right, so let's uh, continue on. All right, so these are not always parasites. Many of them are harmless, most in fact, right? And then there are really only two phylum, the phylum nematoda and the phylum platyhelminths, which we then divide into the class trematode and the class cestode. All right, and some of them have a definitive versus an intermediate host. Some of them are monoecious and some of them are dioecious. Let's start with the nematodes. Okay, here are, here are what nematodes look like under the microscope. They are small enough. Nematodes are universally small. They can't really be seen without the aid of a microscope, although you can use a fairly weak microscope to see them. Uh, the largest nematodes might be up to a millimeter in length or half a millimeter, so you can almost see them, half a millimeter, you can almost see them with the naked eye. All right, now, some of you that took Biology 200 know that, that uh, Conorabditis elegans, or also commonly known as C. elegans, is a model research organism. So people do, are doing research on C. elegans all the time in order to find out about things like cell division and things like that. It's not a, it's not a, a nematode that's of medical research, but it is an important nematode because it's an important nematode to us because there are a lot of scientists who are doing research on it, right? So. Conorabditis elegans is a common research organism. So here you see somebody looking at a small petri dish that's filled with liquid. It's not filled with agar the way you grow bacteria. This is this small petri dish is filled with a liquid that the nematodes live in, that the C. elegans lives in. And if you look under the, you can see people are somebody there is is kind of pushing different worms around with the end of a of a pipette. And if you look on the right, there's a microscope image that they're seeing down the dissecting microscope. So as you know, the dissecting microscope uh, magnifies maybe to 20 or 30 times maximum, 10, 10 or 20 times maximum. So these worms are quite large, not compared to, to you know, they are microscopic, but they're large for microscopic organ, organisms. Okay, so here are some fluorescent microscope images of, of people doing co-localization experiments and things like that using C. elegans. All right, now let's look at an example of a nematode that can be used that has a useful purpose for biotechnology. Okay, so you know that for a long time, humans have been plagued by insects, you know, locusts and uh, other types of insects have been plaguing humans, bothering humans for a long time. Ironically, most of the time they've been bothering humans because humans have been doing things that encourage their growth. For instance, we never had we never had plagues of locusts before humans started cultivating wheat and other grains, right? So suddenly the if you make if you start growing huge amounts of this edible grain, the insects think, well, why can't we eat this as well? And they do, and so the insects multiply. And then there are other lots of other examples of uh, humans are humans tend to be a very disruptive species. And a lot of the times when we have things that cause a big problem for us, it's it's usually because we disrupted the ecological balance and created uh, conditions that favored their development. A, a perfect example is rats. Right? So we, the, the world didn't have nearly as many rats until humans started to cultivate large amounts of food and then store it in common places. Those common places were big and you couldn't, keep them as clean as you wanted and so this provided ideal conditions for rats to breed and and ideal sources of food for them and then we we also provided shipping systems you know sailing ships that ended up taking rats all over the world and so you know there they are they were the rats have had a population explosion in the last 5,000 years because hum because of human civilization okay so that's the irony that was my little speech my little moralization speech about Pest, pests, but let's look at a, uh, you know, so, so typically humans have been trying to get rid of pests using nasty chemicals like herbicides and pesticides and things that, chemicals, nasty chemicals that kill insects and kill weed plants and whatnot. A, a herbicide is a chemical that kills a type of plant that you don't want, and, and a pesticide is usually something that kills an insect that you don't want. 
But we've discovered in the last 50 years or so that those chemicals that we're using to control the pests are not very good for us either. So we've been looking for biological alternatives. So one of those, this is a good example of one of those alternatives. Now, those of you that have lived in Vancouver for a while, you may have noticed that every few years, people's front lawns start getting torn up like this. People's beautiful, people want to, people take pride in the grass on their front lawn. They want it to look nice. And it ends up looking like this. And usually it looks like that because raccoons or crows are pecking away and eating something underneath it. It's their fault, basically. And what they're pecking, pecking away at is the grub or the larva of a beetle called a chafer beetle. And so these chafer beetles got to Vancouver. They weren't, they're not native to Vancouver. They got, they just got to Vancouver probably on board a ship. Uh, there was a cargo that was contaminated with chafer beetles that was unloaded at the Vancouver port. And then it, they got into the environment and now we, now we, they're here to stay. That's a very common way for humans to spread uh, rogue, what are called rogue species around the planet. A rogue species just means that you, you transport some organism to a place where it has no natural predators and it starts to multiply out of control. So this is a perfect example of that. So the, the chafer beetle appeared in Vancouver probably 20 years ago or something like that and it started becoming a problem over the last 10 years. So the, the instinctive thing to do, so it's not actually harming us other than the fact that now suddenly the crows and the raccoons are, are tearing up our gardens and tearing up our beautiful landscapes to try and get at the grubs. Right, so there are, the, there are the chafer beetle grubs just under the surface of the grass, and these are very juicy and tasty. The, the crows and the raccoons love them. And so it's actually the crows and the raccoons that are tearing up your, your lawn. Now, the first instinct of humans would be to kill these insects with some kind of pesticide, which you could do, except that that is now illegal in many places like Vancouver. It's illegal to kill insects in your garden with pesticides. So humans are looking for, people are looking for some natural mechanism. So what do you do? Do, they, do these things have any natural predators? Is there any natural thing that you can treat them with that will kill them? And the answer is yes. Right. There is a nematode called Heterohabditis bacteriophorus, Heterohabditis bacteriophorus, which is a uh, it is a bio, it's a it's a nematode that that uh, some clever people have have figured out that it 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 preys on these kind of grubs. Right, so you put these little, it's a nematode pesticide. It's a nematode pesticide. You spray these little worms on your garden. They don't hurt anything else except the chafer beetle grubs. Right, it's very expensive, but it is a natural solution. It's much more expensive than pesticides, but it does, it does work. But although, you know, so if you spray nematodes on your garden to keep the, to keep the chafer beetles away and your neighbor doesn't, they'll come back. They'll come back to your garden anyway. Right, so the what happens is the chafer beetles, uh, the chafer beetles, uh, the chafer beetle grubs get get all killed, and then once the chafer beetle grubs are all killed, the nematodes have nothing left to eat, and so they die out. And then from your next door neighbor, the chafer beetle comes back. Some adult chafer beetles come around and they lay eggs in your garden. But it's an interesting. This is a this is a very interesting field for biologists to go into, and that is biologists. There's a new specialty that biologists are just finding where they look for natural ways to kill pests. Right? So for example, Vancouver has been kind of at the forefront of this strategy for many years, trying to use natural methods to kill pests. And so a few years ago, we had probably not a few years ago, probably two decades ago, 20 years ago, we had an infestation of aphids in Vancouver. And the city responded to that by breeding and then throwing around a whole bunch of uh, ladybugs because ladybugs um, ladybugs eat aphids naturally. And then when the when the when the ladybugs had finished eating all the aphids, they starved and they they disappeared as well. But we went we went for a period in the early 90s where we had. Uh, if you had a garden, you would have all of your nice tomato plants and the other vegetables were dying because they were covered with aphids. Aphids are saprophyte insects, so they suck the sap out of the plants and they kill your plants. And then the city started putting ladybugs all over the place. And then the ladybugs, so there was a period in the early 90s when 
your house was if you left the windows open in the summer your house would fill up with ladybugs and then then the, they they disappeared after the aphids that, that were all gone okay so heterohabditis bacteriophorus is a nematode that is being used for a useful purpose which is to kill the chafer beetle it's one of the interesting examples of using natural predators to kill pest insects and other things okay so that's an example now let's look at some examples of parasitic nematodes that are dangerous to humans okay starting with toxicara canis the word canis includes the word canine and then toxic toxicara cati Canine refers to dogs. Canine refers to dogs or other animals that have canine teeth. Right, so these things are carried, these things infect dogs and cats and they get into dog and cat feces. They might get ingested by children in playgrounds. Right, now, these, uh, these nematodes cause a disease called toxicariasis, toxicariasis. And it's also known as, depending on how the toxicariasis takes shape, those the disease toxicariasis can also be called ocular larva migrans ocular larva migrans olm that means what that means is that ocular larva migrans means that these nematode worms get under the skin and they crawl around which is quite disgusting and traumatic and in the case of ocular larva migrans they actually get under the conjunctiva of the eye so they crawl around just under the surface of your eye and they could cause blindness which is very bad Okay, and, and then toxicariasis can also take the form of visceral larva migrans, which just means that they crawl around under the skin. Okay, so humans are not the definitive host. The animals, the dogs and cats are the definitive host. Right? So the larva wander around just under the skin looking for a place to mature and they can't find it, but it could cause vision loss, blindness. All right? So that's toxicara canis and toxic, toxicara cati. Ancelostoma duodenale, commonly known as hookworm, is also found in animal feces and in the dirt. It often enters through the skin when you step on it with a bare foot. It's not common around here in Vancouver, but there are many parts of the world where it is common. So people in the, under those circumstances, people should not walk around on the soil in bare feet. And then, as the name suggests, Duodenale refers to the duodenum, which is part of the small intestine. Those of you that took Biology 130 know that the duodenum is the first part of the small intestine to make contact with the stomach. So the stomach ends, enters, uh, empties directly into the duodenum, then the, then the jejunum, and then the, ili, uh, the ileum. Okay, so it lives in the duodenum. It prefers to live in the duodenum. All right, Dirofilaria imitus. Dogs are the, it causes a disease called heartworm, which is where the lar these nematodes burrow into muscles, including the heart muscle, causing a damaged heart. Right? Dogs are the definitive host. Humans, are, humans have rare infections, but humans are an intermediate host. And here's the important point to remember. Dif Dirofilaria imitis, heartworm, is carried by a mosquito vector. Right? So mosquitoes can carry heartworm. Uh, it's very rare for humans to get infections of heartworm. Uh, if they, if it was common, we'd be quite, we'd have reason to be quite worried about it. Uh, and then, but because it's carried by mosquitoes, and if you think it's difficult to get rid of a disease that's transmitted by droplet transmission, it's really difficult to get rid of a disease that's caused by mosquito by a mosquito vector. Okay, and then Trichinella spiralis, we remember from the first week's lecture, it's caught from undercooked meat that's been hunted, right? And it, the, the worms burrow into muscle tissue causing trichinosis. Okay, so these are all dioecious. All, all of these organisms have two sexes. Okay, so toxo Toxocara canis and Toxocara cati are, uh, this is the reason why we have signs on the children's playground saying no dogs allowed. Theoretically, no cats are allowed either. And the reason for that is because dogs will defecate in the soil. And then if children get the soil in their mouths, because children, particularly children that are crawling around, but children that are f flying off of the slide and they land face down in the dirt might have some some uh, worms might get some dirt in their mouth and some worms right so it is carried these are carried by animal excrement but particularly dogs and that's why we have no dogs allowed in the children's playground 
dirt into the mouth, you ingest them, so they're taken in through the oral fecal route, technically. They could also be taken in by improperly washed vegetables that have been grown in the dirt, right? So if you, uh, if for, for you hobby farmers that are growing victory gardens, they used to call them in Canada, you know, they probably everywhere else in the world during World War II in Britain, it was a, it was a thing where they would encourage people to grow their own vegetables in their own garden. And they would call that a victory garden because then you didn't have to buy as much food from the grocery and then the grocery store. Uh, anyway, so if you grow your own gardens, vegetables in your own garden within the city, then there's a lot of dogs and cats around in the city. Not so many dogs and cats on a farm, but per capita, there, there are a lot of dogs per capita in the city. So if you have dogs running around and cats running around defecating on the ground and then you dig up the vegetables and you don't wash them, you could get toxicanic uh, can canny. Ancelostoma du duodenale. Right. So you get it when you step on the soil with your bare feet in certain parts of the world and they burrow into the skin under your foot. I'm going to show you a slightly disturbing image of that happening. There it is. Right. So the nematode is, is wandering around under the surface of the skin, causing all kinds of problems. Eventually it may get into the duodenum and then it gets into the feces because the place it likes to live is the duodenum. Again, you can catch it from undercooked or un improperly washed vegetables again. These are the areas where you have to worry about this. So you can see that, that this is not endemic to Canada or British Columbia or North or South America or even Europe, but many places in Africa, a few places in, in, uh, in, this, in the Pacific Rim, uh, you have to worry about this. So th those are places where you should not walk around barefoot on the soil. Okay, di Dirofilaria imitus heartworm is carried by a mosquito vector. It commonly infects dogs, which are the definitive host. Once in a while it infects humans. It infects humans enough that we need to worry about it. So that's one of the reasons why uh, you should always check if your dog is having problems. You should always cure the dog. If the veterinarian determines the dog has heartworm, you should cure the dog of the heartworm quickly because it could theoretically spread to humans. Once in a while it does. Okay, so these are dioecious again. All right, Trichinella spiralis comes from hunted meats, right? So it burrows into the muscle tissue of the animal that you're eating. And then if, if the meat was not properly cooked, the cysts, which are filled with the worm eggs, could burrow into your skin as well, right? So there's an x-ray showing the little, all these little white spots are Trichinella spiralis that have burrowed their way into the legs. Right, this is just demonstrating that you swallow the undercooked meat, the cysts will uncoat in the stomach and they'll, the, the worms will survive and they'll burrow their way into the walls of the intestine and then they'll migrate around. Occasionally they can cause damage in the central nervous system. They can lay, lay eggs and create cysts inside the heart or the brain. More commonly they just do that in the regular muscles but they could do it in the heart as well which is a, which is a muscle. All right, now I mentioned the fact that there are a, a, there is a classification of diseases that are called filariases. Up there, filariasis is the singular. Filariases, if you substitute an E for an E for the I, you would have filariases. Okay, so these are diseases, a bunch of diseases that are caused by members of the super of the nematode, phylum nematode class order and superfamily. The superfamily is called filaroidea. So the, fam the superfamily Filaroidae is a large family of uh, nematode worms that cause diseases that we classify as filariases because they're caused by members of the Filaroidae family. Okay, so these three are Filaroid members of the Filaroidae family, which are all members of the phylum Nematoda. Right, so Dirofilaria imitus, dog heartworm, Right, caused by the mosquito vector. That is a, an example of a filariasis. Wuchereria bancrofti is which causes elephantiasis. Massive swelling causes massive swelling due to the 
microscopic worms clogging the lymphatic system. The purpose of the lymphatic system is to drain swelling, uh, drain tissue, drain excess fluid away from soft tissues. The worms happen to be, the Wuchereria bancrofti worms happen to be just the right diameter to clog the lymphatic ducts in the lymphatic system and causing swelling to certain parts of the body. If the arms and the legs are, are affected, the arms or the legs could swell up to the point where they, they kind of turn gray and they, and they have a lot of wrinkles and they look a lot like an elephant trunk, which is where the term came from because they look like the trunk of an elephant. Okay, and then Oncocircus volvulus. Uh, humans are actually the definitive host, which is something you should probably remember. They are spread by a black fly vector, which is an intermediate host. Right? And it causes a disease called river blindness because once again, the nematode worm crawls around underneath the surface of the conjunct conjunctiva of the eye, potentially blinding you. Uh, it's called river blindness, of course, because the flies tend to be around the river. This is not endemic to North America. It is endemic. It's endemic to many parts of Africa. So this is a, something to be worried about, river blindness, a common disease in certain countries in Africa. Okay, so di Dirofilaria imitis, uh, you can easily get rid of it by giving your dog these little chewable treats that, that contain a chemical that specifically kills Dirofilaria imitis. Wuchereria bancrofti causing elephantiasis. I'm going to show you some disturbing images, so brace yourself. This is elephantiasis, right? So you see this poor woman has extremely swollen legs because the lymphatic ducts are clogged by Wuchereria bancrofti. All right, now th these are the areas where river blindness is an issue. Some parts of, of uh, South America and Central America, some parts of Africa. And it is spread by the insect, uh, the insect on the left, which is a black fly. It's a biting insect, so this disease gets into you through the parenteral route, and it occasionally causes blindness because these these nematodes wander around under the skin. One of their favorite places to wander around and feed is underneath the surface of your eye. The white part of your eye is called the conjunctiva. They like to wander around there. All right, so you can actually cure it. Uh, you can filter, you, 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 you can, uh, sorry, you can take uh, uh, d drugs that eliminate the disease. Uh, now, here's, again, I will not test you on this. I will not test you on this. Uh, hopefully, in these lectures, I differentiate between things that you need to know versus things that it's nice to know. And so this, again, is one of the, this, this again, river blindness caused by Oncocircus volvulus is one of these areas where microbiology intersects with history and politics. And I, I like it when that happens because it, to me, it makes microbiology a more interesting subject. Okay, so do you know who this guy is in the right-hand picture? Anyone know who this guy is? That is Jimmy Carter, who was the president of the United States, uh, I believe from about 1976 to 1980. Uh, he was only a one-term president of the United States. Here he is talking to, uh, talking to Leonid Brezhnev, who was the, who was the, pri the premier of, of the Soviet Union at the time. Uh, Carter, uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, sometimes I have uh, Persian students in the class. Uh, you can, if you don't remember who Carter is, you can ask your parents and they'll probably say that they hate him. Uh, Persians are not very fond of Jimmy Carter because uh, a lot of Persians blame him for the, uh, for the, uh, the rise of the theocracy in, in Iran um, because like he could have done something about it to stop it and he didn't um, or didn't do enough to try and stop it. So there are a lot of, a lot of Persians who dis strongly dislike Jimmy Carter. Uh, anyway, but the Africans don't. The, uh, many of the people in African countries where they have river blindness do not dislike Jimmy Carter because he, it's common in the United States when a president retires from being president, they start up a charitable foundation where people that admired that president donate money to that charitable foundation and they use it for certain things. So Jimmy Carter, uh, after he was president, he uh, started up the Carter Foundation which raised a lot of money, which was almost all exclusively used to treat river blindness in Africa. 
uh, Jimmy, Car Jimmy Carter, just as uh, the Carter Center and the Carter Foundation, just as another point of interest, is that one of the, Jimmy Carter uh, sponsors two uh, two charities. One is the River Blindness, cure, curing river blindness in Africa, and the other is the uh, I believe it's called the Habitat uh, the Habitat Foundation, where people devote their spare time to building houses for the poor uh, in, in the United States. Uh, so Jimmy Carter at age 97, I think he is, is still out every weekend building houses for the poor. So on a, I don't, you know, I don't know what you think of his politics, but as a, a on a personal level, I, I admire him, right? On a personal level, I've always admired Jimmy Carter, but many people disapprove, strongly disapprove with his political actions when he was president. That's another matter. So it, it is possible to admire some somebody at a personal level and disagree disagree strongly at a philosophical level. All right, let's move on to the platy helmets, the flukes and the and the and the tapeworms. Okay, so within the the uh, so we have four classes within the platy helmets. They are the class trematoda, the flukes, the class cestoda, the tapeworms. And then we have the class Turbillaria and the class Monogenea. The class uh, Turbillaria and Monogenea are very common in aquatic environments on the in intertidal zones at the beach and the sea, but they're perfectly harmless to humans, so we're not going to talk about those. However, you should be aware that there are four classes of the, trem of the, of the platy helmets, and two of them are perfectly harmless. And so I might ask you a multiple choice question where I say, you know, which two are perfectly harmless and which two contain members that are dangerous to humans. So you should be aware that the class ter uh, Turbillaria and the class Monogenea are harmless to humans, whereas the Trematodes and the Cestodes contain many members that are harmful to humans. Okay, so this illustrates that there's a member of the turbal area up there. It's underwater. It's a nice sea, kind of a sea worm that doesn't bother anybody. Right. And over here we have the, the, the monogenea are, the class monogenea are microscopic, right? And sometimes uh, when we have, uh, in first year, you might remember if you attended uh, Biology 110 before the pandemic and you were actually able to do the lab in person, we have a bottle full of, uh, some monogenea that you get to look at under the microscope and they're live, they're crawling around under the microscope. And then down at the bottom we have the trematodes and we have the, we have the uh, cestoda, the trem trematodes and cestoda. Now notice that the trematodes, these three images here are of the ventral side, that's the belly, not the back. So the back side, the back part of an animal is called the dorsal side. The ve the, the belly side is called the ventral side. Uh, unless you're talking about human anatomy in which you distinguish between the anterior and the posterior side instead of the do dorsal and the ventral side. But when we're talking about animals, it almost always you, you refer to the side that the belly is on as the ventral side. So we're looking at the ventral side of all three of these trematodes and one of the things they all have in common is a sucking disc, right? So they have a little mouth there that they use to suck and hold on to things. And that's how they stick to the inside of you, by sucking on to you with the inside. All right, so let's just look at the dangerous ones. Okay, so the class trematodes, the trematodes are non-segmented flatworms. They're much smaller than the, than the cestodes. They have an oral ventral sucker. So I showed you that they, uh, oral is a fancy word for mouth, of course. It's located on the ventral side of the worm. And it's a sucker that it uses to attach to things. Right? Um, these, the trematodes, are monoecious. They're monoecious hermaphrodites, which means that there's, only, they don't, they, there's not a male and a female trematode. They are hermaphrodites. They have sex organs for both, both types of sex, or, sex organs. Okay, the cestodes are the tapeworms. They're segmented. They have the head of a tapeworm. The head of a cestode is referred to as a scolex. You do need to know that. I often ask what the head of a cestode is called. They are made up of a number of different segments which are called proglottids. You do need to know what that is because I often ask about that. And the, the scolex, the head, usually has a number of hooks on it. 
and the hooks are used to attach to the inside of the intestine of the of the host organism usually and they are dioecious which means that they're males and females right so the 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 kind of a person that spreads a disease from a cestode is somebody that's been infected with two different cestodes a male and a female they made it in the person's intestine and then the female hangs on and grows bigger and bigger and the female lays her eggs inside the proglottids which uh, are shed they break off and they shed out of the body with the feces and so that's how the that's how the species gets propagated let's start by looking at the flukes the trematodes Okay, so there are usually several different definitive hosts. Several different hosts. Some are definitive. Some are some are intermediate. Uh, humans are usually the definitive host. Uh, so they they are often many of them are released into the water through the oral fecal route where they lay eggs. The eggs hatch into a swimming form, which is called a mercidium, or, or miracidium rather, miracidium. Right. And then usually the miracidium swims around in the water and then invades an intermediate host, which is a freshwater snail. Right. So this is a big clue that you should avoid swimming or walking around in water where you see freshwater snails. So uh, freshwater snails, you'll usually see them stuck to blades of grass that are growing out of shallow ponds. You do see some of these in British Columbia, but we don't have a lot of flukes that are endemic to British Columbia, so it's not a problem. But it is a, that, it's a huge problem in, in Southeast Asia. So uh, walking around in rice paddies, for instance, in bare feet is a bad idea because you'll often see freshwater snails in there sometimes. And the freshwater snails are an intermediate host for some, many of the flukes. Right, so the, the, the eggs hatch and the, the eggs get into the water from animal feces or human feces. The eggs hatch into a miracidium. The miracidium swims around and eventually penetrates and invades a freshwater snail. It then develops further in the freshwater snail and then comes out in another form called a cerceria, uh, also known as a euglena, a euglena. Right. It emerges from the snails, it swims around, and then it either goes into a fish, depending on which type of fluke we're talking about, or it bites the lower leg of a human and gets into the human, or it invades a freshwater plant and the human eats the freshwater plant. So all three of those things happen depending on which type of fluke we're talking about. And then they, after having passed through an egg and then the miracidium and then a euglena, it gets into a human who is the definitive host or an animal, other animals will do. And it matures into a mature woman and lays eggs that gets into the intestine and then it goes back to step one again. All right, so here we have the oral fecal root where the, the uh, the flukes are, the mature flukes are in the intestine, they lay eggs. Right, the eggs get into the feces. So if you have an area where, where you have water that's contaminated by human feces, right? So that, that is, or animal feces in some cases, that's how, you, how the eggs get into the water. They hatch, they turn into a swimming form called a miracidia. It's a ciliate, the a ciliated swimming form that swims around with the aid of cilia. The miracidia invades the intermediate host, which is the freshwater snail. It matures some more inside the snail and then comes out as a cerceria, right, which is distinguishable by this a head and a long tail. These things bite you when you're walking around or swimming around in the water, and then they get into your they get into your intestines and sometimes into their liver, right? And then they you have the adults, there are two sexes, you see the two sexes mating, and then they lay eggs which get into the feces, which perpetuate the whole circle over and over again. So this is very common for areas in Southeast Asia where you have rice paddies or other types of vegetation that's growing in shallow water. Okay, so we'll look at some of the important trematodes. Okay, so Clenor Clenorchus sinensis is also not known as a liver fluke because it does invade the liver. It causes clonarchiasis, clonarchiasis which is caused by clonorchus uh, sinensis. Right? The symptoms are jaundice, which means that your skin turns a shade of yellow. The, the liver fluke invades the gallbladder, right? Causing, it can cause liver cancer. 
And you catch it by walking or swimming in water that's contaminated uh, by this or by eating fish that are contaminated by Clonorchis sinensis. As I said, it's not very common in, it's not, it's not really found in North America. It is found in, in Southeast Asia. Schistosoma mansoni is called a blood fluke because it, and it causes a disease called schistosomiasis, schistosomiasis. What happens is you clog, this particular worm gets into the blood and it clogs the mesentery veins. Now, some of you took biology 130. Do you remember what mesentery veins are? What, what do the mesentery veins drain blood from? They drain blood from the intestines, right? So the mesentery veins drain, uh, it, not actually from the intestines, but from the, uh, from the pleural membrane that surrounds the intestines. And what that happens is, what happens as a result of that is that it causes your stomach, your abdomen, your abdominal area to bloat. Right, so you end up with this huge bloated stomach because the mesentery veins have been clogged. Right, so again, you catch this from walking or swimming in water, and they burrow, they burrow their way through the skin. The euglenozoid form burrows through the skin. Fasciolipsis busci is an intestinal fluke. You catch it by eating water plants that have been invaded, and it causes a disease called fascio, fasciolipsiasis. Again, jaundice and fatigue are the symptoms. They, they are probably the biggest of the flukes. They can grow up to a size of eight centimeters. All right, so Clonorchis sinensis is a hermaphrodite. You can see this is a ventral uh, shot. You can see the ventral up here, uh, over here on the left is the ventral sucker. Uh, so that's how it attaches to the inside, of your, the, the inside of your liver or the inside of your body. This is a close up of it. All right, so you can see the sucking, the ventral sucker here, and here you can see it stuck onto onto skin cells. Okay, this is the myricidium form. It's a ciliated, the the intermediate form, which makes its way into freshwater snails, and then it emerges as a euglena. So here, if you see these freshwater snails in a body of water, usually stuck to reeds or to grass in the water, you should stay out of that water. Definitely don't swim in it or eat it or drink it. Definitely don't walk in it unless you're wearing rubber waders. Right now, here's here. This is interesting. The the euglenozoid forms have a unique shape. So this is the uh, this is the euglenozoid form of C. sinensis. And notice the tail has one doesn't have a fork, but this is the the euglenozoid form of Schistosoma mansoni, which has a biffed tail, has a biphoid tail. So you can uh, you know a parasitologist could tell you which which form of euglenozoan this was just by looking at it. Okay, so here's how you get it. It contaminates the you know it, it, the eggs get into the water through the oral fecal route. And then it gets into the, 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 the myricidia form. The myricidia form here gets into the snails. It then emerges later as a circidia, which wanders around and either penetrates fish, and then you eat the fish, or you get penetrated directly when it stings, if it stings your feet as you're walking around in the water. Notice where I got this chart from, the Center for Disease Control in the United States. So oral entry is the most common way for the for for Clonorchis uh, sinensis. Schistosoma, Manso Schistosoma mansoni, right? So there are two sexes. It is a dioecious species, right? So this is this is where the chart came from. It gets into the water through the or oral fecal route. It it the Mercidia penetrates freshwater snails. The euglenozoan form over here bites you in the leg, you get a little uh, sore spot that looks like you were bitten by a mosquito or something while you were walking in the water, and then suddenly it's in your blood. Right, so it can get in through animal feces as well as human feces. This is a prime way to catch it, right? So you're plowing a field without any shoes on, you're plowing your way through the mud, that's a common way to get it. Right, skin entry. Easy way to prevent it, if you can get, get a hold of these things, waders, then you don't have that problem anymore. Easy way to prevent it, that type of an infection. Fasciolepsis busci, it's a hermaphrodite with a ventral sucking disc is, again. Okay, so again, it gets into the water through feces. There's a snail intermediate, freshwater snail intermediate, and a circinia form. 
in this case the most common way to catch th uh, the, the most common way to catch it is by eating water plants particularly water chestnuts right so water chestnuts is the most common way to contract this by eating water plants right water chestnuts now let's look at the tapeworms quickly the life cycle of a tapeworm is fairly simple. They have only one host, farm animals or humans. They're both definitive hosts. There aren't really any intermediate hosts. And they are transmitted through the oral fecal route. Actually, they're transmitted through the oral fecal route for the animals, and they're transmitted through the oral, just the oral route when humans, uh, they're transmitted as a zoonotic infection from, for humans. All right, so let's look at, again, these terminology term, terms, a scolex. Scolex is the head. It has multiple hooks on it or suckers for attachment. A, the body is called the strobola. And the strobola is made of, because if you look at it, it's strobes. If you look up the word strobe, S-T-R-O-B-E, uh, -O strobe, that's, what it, that's the kind of movement it makes when it's in your intestine. It's kind of like, like somebody has a whip and they're whipping it. Uh, and the strobula is made out of proglottids that contain the reproductive structures, and I'll show you what that looks like. These are dioecious worms. They have two sexes. The eggs are fertilized inside the female proglottids, and then the proglottids break off the end of the female and get into the feces, and then they get into the dirt, and then if you eat vegetables that are not clean, or if you eat, uh, they also produce cysts, uh, little egg containers, containing eggs that are in the meat of the animals as well. So you can contract this by eating undercooked meat that contains the cysts. There's, here's a close-up of the strobula. You can see these things here are the suckers and these are the hooks. So this is a this particular species of uh, cestode has both hooks and suckers. Sometimes they have only one or the other, but many of them have both. These are scanning electron microscope images of the scolex of, of uh, uh, cestodes. You can see suckers and hooks. And then, so here we have the scolex, then we have the strobula, the body, and the strobula. So the head by now is the smallest part, but the body segments just keep on getting bigger and bigger. Notice that they're flat, the segments are all flat. And so here we have a close-up of one of the proglottids. This is a female, this is from a female cestode, and you can see that it's full of eggs. And then if we looked at the if we looked at the proglottids of the of a male uh, cestode, it would be full of spermatozoa. So the eggs, every body segment is like a little container that contains eggs to be fertilized. And then as the worm matures, these proglottids break off of the end and come out with the feces as little kind of little packages filled with eggs. All right, that little arrow, the red arrow at the bottom is the scolex of this particular, uh, this particular tapeworm. And this thing here is a meter stick, believe it or not. All right, so this, this, this particular tapeworm grows to an enormous size. It starts out as a little tiny egg. It latches the head, the scolex latches onto the, onto the inside of your intestine and it just keeps on growing because it's absorbing your food basically it's stealing your food uh, you notice this because you develop jaundice you kind of turn yellow you have lack of energy because because you're this this uh, worm is stealing a lot of your food and you lose weight uh, although that's a very disgusting way to lose weight I wouldn't want to lose weight that way if somebody was trying to lose weight with a diet or something that would be preferable Okay, so here's what it looks like inside a human colon. So you can see this is the, in, we, you've seen the human colon before uh, in, the, in the other images I showed you. So here you see the scolex kind of wrapped around the inside. Okay, so let's learn some of the species. Tanea saginata, Tanea saginata is known as beef tapeworm. It infects cattle, the cysts are eaten by you humans if you have undercooked beef, and then it can grow up to 10 meters. Tanea solium, again, it's a pork tapeworm, grows in infected pigs, the cysts are eaten, eaten by humans. They will be killed if you cook the meat properly. If you undercook it, then you can get uh, pork tapeworm. And then finally, Dyrophilobothrium latum, 
normally infects fish if you ingest the cysts it can grow up to 15 meters so diphilobothrium latum is the largest when fully grown in all cases they make cysts in some cases the the worm before it if it if it doesn't make its way to the intestine it may burrow through the skin get into the bloodstream wander around and then end up laying cysts uh, little tiny cysts inside different parts of the body those cysts are particularly damaging if they're found in the head in the brain because that that is lethal all right so teniasis teniasis is what they call the disease when you uh, when you get the tapeworm in your intestine. Cystocirrhosis is what they call it if the cysts get into your brain and then you have encephalitis of the brain, so your brain dies basically from inflammation. Okay. Okay, so here's the cycle. You get it from getting meat from unregulated, uninspected pig farms or beef farms. Right? The strobula breaks off, gets into the gets into the soil if if feces gets into the soil. All right, so just another chart from the CDC. All right, so to summarize, we studied the difference between nematodes, trematodes, and cestodes. We learned about several different important uh, nematodes. We learned about several important flukes, and we learned several important cestodes. So these are all the nematodes we learned about and the diseases they cause. We learned that three of them are, are uh, uh, Dyrophilia, Dyrophilaria imitis, Wuchereria bancrofti, and Onchocercus volvulus cause filariases. Uh, those the, those illnesses are classified as filariases because they're all members of the superfamily Filaroidae. And then we learned about uh, a, a few of the important flukes. They have humans as the definitive hosts, and then they have intermediate hosts. They're often uh, freshwater snails. And then we learned about the large tapeworms that are members of the cestode group. All right, our next lecture is on important fungi. Thank you very much.